This week's video is all about charging batteries, whether they're lead acid, gel, AGM or lithium iron. All of these types of batteries have advantages and disadvantages and they all have slightly different profiles for charging. We get asked a lot about batteries and how to charge them, so we made a video. Every boat's electrical system is going to be slightly different. Even mass-produced boats have variances between the models. Some models have two half cabins, some have one. So there's always a difference in their wiring diagrams. So as always, we're going to start right at the beginning. Now do you remember the days when you had one battery on your boat? This battery was primarily for starting the engine, but often it would have a few domestic items on a distribution board which would run from it, like lights. The next step up would be a two battery boat. A two battery boat would have a dedicated starter battery. Starter batteries tend to have a lower amp hour rating but a higher cold cranking rating. That's marked as CCA on the side of your battery. The ledger battery would have a much higher amp hour rating and that's usually rated over 20 hours of discharge. The two batteries are both charged from the alternator and this is done using a split charge diode unit. There is some loss in split charge diode units and they're not as efficient as modern electronic ones. We'll touch on that later. Some older boats have a battery isolation switch which has one, two and all written on it. There's nothing wrong with this system, even if it is a bit old hat, but you'll always find someone in the anchorage that's forgotten to switch from all back to one or back to two and has a flat battery and can't start their engine. Yep, we've all done it. Now, not all batteries are created equal, so for illustration purposes, I'm just going to refer to batteries generically. Of course, these ones will be Ant's super high performance 200 amp hour batteries, but just for illustration. Now, the average cruiser won't need as much battery life as perhaps a liverboard. Most liverboards will have three or four batteries, usually quite a large bank, and somewhere between 400 and 600 amp hours, depending on what type of battery they have. The primary means of charging those batteries, both at engine batteries, and the domestic batteries will be the alternator and that's part of the engine system unless of course you're an electric boat engine alternators can get an awful lot of wattage into your battery but your alternator can only put the wattage into the battery that the battery can accept we'll come back to that in a minute let's draw in our alternator to go with our battery bank with the efficiency of solar panels going up and up every year, it's most likely that as a cruiser, you'll have quite a big array of solar panels. And of course, you'll have some kind of charge controller. You may also have a wind generator or one of those fancy duo gens, and you'll also need a charge regulator for that. Let's put one of them in as well. If your boat is big enough and you have the room, you may have a generator or gen set. Now these can either be fixed and permanent part of the boat, or some people are using these small Honda type generators now, suitcase ones. Let's put one of those in. Well, let's put both in. Now while both of these gen sets do have a small charging circuit, 
it's not big enough for your main batteries and you're going to need a battery charger that works from mains or mains voltage. The generator or genset will power the battery charger and the profiles of the battery charger can be changed in order to suit the type of battery that you've got usually by dip switches inside but some have a link via Bluetooth which allows you to alter the profile of the battery charging. So let's put our battery charger in as well and just to keep everybody happy I'll make it dual voltage European and American. They are. Can't say fairer than that can I? Now you may laugh but some battery chargers don't have dual voltage. In fact it seems that some of them purposefully don't have dual voltage so they can sell you another charger. But that's another matter. Now the observant among you will notice that I've added another two of Ant's super duper batteries. One will be for the starter motor but the other one might be for a bow thruster or maybe a windlass. So let's be sure to put them in. Now you recall earlier back at the beginning we talked about splitter diodes or split charge diodes which allowed a current from the alternator to go to a number of different batteries. In this case two. But there are some which don't just do two. They may do three or four sets of batteries or be run in parallel. This is the one we have. Now unlike diodes which are a one-way valve for electricity and have a, a voltage loss of maybe 0.7 a volt across them these new electronic ones don't have that loss or have a very low loss and therefore they're more efficient. We've actually covered this in our Boat Electrical Made Easy series of videos. You might want to go and take a look at that. I think you'll enjoy it. Anyway, back to the drawing board. So I've now drawn in two different types of split charging system as you can see at the top left hand corner. These are regulators. The first one on the left is an internal regulator for the alternator. The second is an external regulator and we'll be looking more at those when we look at lithium charging. So let's have a little recap because someone at the back of the class there isn't paying attention. Wake up boy. Our main sources of power generation are from our engine or engines, from solar, from wind or hydro, from our gensets or from mains hookup. And this is the way we put power into our batteries. Let's have a brief interlude, remind ourselves why we go sailing. sources of power drawn out on this schematic but you'll note that I haven't connected any of them to the batteries. Why is that? 
Why do you think I haven't done that? Well, the answer is profiles. Each different type of battery has a slightly different charging profile, the same as they do discharging profiles. And it's that which is the limitation of some of the setups that we see and those that you ask us about. Now, the experts among you will know it's slightly more complicated than I'm going to make it because I'm making it simple. Generally, all lead-based batteries have a three-stage cycle in which they're charged. This is primarily one, bulk, which is a constant current. Then stage two, which is an absorption, a constant voltage. And then stage three, which is float or fully charged. Now some of these chargers have a couple of other modes where they can come out of float and then reassess where the battery needs a top up or they can put the battery into hibernation. Either way, there's basically only three stages of charging. And as you can see from this table here, stolen from Wikipedia, all batteries have a slightly different charging regime and it's that which you need to set up on your regulator or charger to get the best out of your batteries. Now there's a major problem with lead acid batteries and there always has been regardless of whether they're gel, AGM or wet cells. The problem is the internal resistance. These batteries can only be charged up to about 80% in the best cases on AGM before they start to drop off and you may spend hours and hours and hours getting the last 20% up to full charge. And of course, with all lead acid batteries, it's advisable not to take them below 50% state of charge. So you need a bigger set of batteries to get the same amount of power out as they're actually rated at. You know, 500 amp hours of batteries won't actually give you 500 amp hours it will give you about 250 and when you charge it up you'll get to about 80% of full state of charge and then the generator no matter how big it is whether it's wind solar or mains will slow down and the last 20% will take forever and that's the disadvantage of lead acid batteries so here's the thing if you go to buy a battery and you cannot get the correct technical information on its charging profile, don't buy it. Go somewhere else. A reputable manufacturer will always provide this information. Remember, with lead-based batteries, you're only going to get about 50% of their capacity. And if that's reduced by a bad charging regime, you could end up with just 40% usable. And very soon, you could end up with flat batteries. In 99% of the cases that we see where batteries have failed, it's because of their charging regime or the way in which they've been used. The batteries are not at fault. As batteries get older, they're even more susceptible to bad management. Just out of interest, Tell me in the comments if you actually know what the charging profile of your batteries is. It's really important. You should have it on board your boat and you should roughly know what it is. Otherwise, all the monitoring equipment that you've got to make sure your batteries are charged is, well, useless. So why is there such a big fuss over lithium? Well, it's about capacity, weight and the way that they charge. Now I've got this graph up on the screen but actually what you want to look at or want to understand is that the cell voltage inside a lithium battery is completely different to that of a lead acid based battery. Um, let's give you an example. A lead acid battery's nominal voltage is 2.2 volts for each cell. For a single cell the voltage can range from 1.8 volts loaded at full discharge to 2.1 volts in an open circuit at full charge. With six cells to a lead acid battery at 12 volts, 
This could be as much as 13.2 volts overall, and that's the nominal voltage. Now let's look at the lithium cells. Normal lithium voltage cell is around 3.6 volts per cell. Some cell manufacturers mark their lithium iron as 3.7 volts per cell or even higher. This offers a marketing advantage because the higher voltage boosts the watt hours on paper of the capacity of the battery. And that, I'm sure as you know, is because voltage multiplied by current equals watts. Bit sneaky, eh? Now four cells at 3.6 volts per cell gives you 14.4 volts as a nominal voltage. Up it to 3.7 and you can see that the nominal voltage goes up to 14.8 volts. Lithium batteries, when they reach these higher voltages per cell, also start to do a thing called balancing. Each cell is balanced, usually by the BMS, to ensure that all of the cells remain at the same fully charged state. And this needs to be done fairly regularly, maybe once a fortnight or so. Now with the Life PO4 batteries that you're likely to be buying for your boat, this balancing happens inside the battery using an electronic battery management system or BMS. And most of the so-called drop-in batteries that you see have this BMS and a battery balancing system integrated within the battery system itself. The BMS will protect the battery cells from overcharging or over discharging and will actually shut the battery down should the battery's voltage be either too high or too low for any of the cells. It's almost idiot proof isn't it? Many of these battery management systems have a Bluetooth link and you can get an app on your phone that shows you exactly how the lithium battery is performing both overall and as individual cells. With some regulators and chargers, control of the BMS can be handed over to that controller. So if your solar regulator or charge controller is controlling the input to your BMS and your lithium, or you're charging from a mains charger which is being powered by your genset or mains hookup, then everything's under control. They can all cope. They're all capable of putting out a certain amount of voltage and amperage, of course. And that profile for charging can be altered according to the parameters which your battery supplier sets up or gives you. If we take a typical drop-in battery of, say, 100 amp hours, even with the BMS in control, these batteries are likely to be able to take over 100 amps in charging current and because of their low resistance they will do. The problem is if you have four of those batteries that they could demand 400 amps. The typical output of most alternators on cruising boats is in the range of 60 to say 120 amps. Because of the high demand that lithium has and the fact that it has such a low internal resistance the alternator could be asked to provide all of its capacity, even at very low revs, and this can cause overheating of the alternator. Now there are some people out there, and yes, standby keyboard warriors, who say it's quite okay to connect an AGM battery in parallel with your lithium. I would strongly advise against this. You're probably going to avoid the warranty on your batteries. Use what they suggest. Now I appreciate there are other people before me who have said, yeah, you can do it, it's fine. But for me, I'd rather do it the approved way. Anyway, let's get back to lithium. So, in order to stop your alternator from overheating at low revs, you can do one of two things. The first thing you can do is to fit an external regulator this will monitor the temperature of your alternator and make sure it's not putting out more energy than it can adequately cool itself for. I'd suggest you use something like this, the WS500. The only downside is it's likely to cost you as much as one single battery. They are very expensive. 
The other thing you can do is to use something like this, a battery to battery charger. You simply put one of these in parallel with either your engine battery or one of your old domestic batteries and the alternator will charge the domestic or the engine battery as normal and this, the Orion TR Smart, will charge your lithium batteries at up to 30 amps per unit. Obviously with two units it's 60 amps. A word of warning though, they do get extremely hot and need fan cooling on the back. I wouldn't put them anywhere which isn't extremely well ventilated. Both the WS500 and the Orion B2B, you could change the profiles of the batteries you're charging, i.e. from AGM or lead acid to lithium. And again, this ensures that you're able to set the parameters of your charging for your lithium to what they should be according to your manufacturer. So what can we say in summary? Well, I guess whatever type of battery you decide is right for your boat, whether it's lithium or whether it's gel, AGM or even a wet cell, you have to be sure that the charging profiles for that type of battery are correct. Your battery supplier or the installer should have that information ready to hand and if they haven't, don't fit their batteries. Well I hope this video has been useful to you and you've got something out of it. We've enjoyed making it for you. Please leave us a like, a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, hit that button down the bottom. Don't forget guys, sail safe. We'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.